Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome to this episode of When Football Was Football in the Sports History Network. I'm your host, Joe Ziemba. He was an imposing figure, whether tracking down opposing quarterbacks or selling caskets. At six foot eight and approximately 280 pounds, with a high jumper's athleticism, it's not difficult to imagine what it was like to play quarterback with this defensive end bearing down on you. His name was Doug Atkins, and after an NFL career that stretched from 1953 to 1969, his portfolio of quotes from terrified quarterbacks combined both respect and humor from those opponents. Legendary Colts quarterback Johnny Unitas once said, If Doug was playing, you were in trouble and in for a long day. And then former Vikings Hall of Famer Fran Tarkington added, He was the strongest man in football and also the biggest. When he rushes the passer with those oak tree arms of his way up in the air, he's 12 feet tall. And if he gets to you, the world starts spinning. Big Doug's own teammate, Rick Caceres, enjoyed watching opposing offensive linemen attempt to derail the manic pass rush of Doug Atkins. He said, we used to hope that somebody would hold him. The next play, you would see guys flying around like King Kong had gotten a hold of them. Aside from being a giant of a man, Doug Atkins also possessed a giant personality. He was a gifted athlete who was not fond of training camps or practices and could be, shall we say, politely disruptive. In other words, the mammoth defensive end would slog through daily workouts, but then found the strength to absolutely terrorize the opposition on Sunday. Bears running back Ronnie Bull recalled one unusual training camp incident, courtesy of Doug Atkins, back when the team trained in rural Rensselaer, Indiana, and Atkins was not anxious to practice, Ronnie Bull said. About the most exciting thing we got to do down there in Rensselaer was watch the grass grow. During the afternoon, we practiced in full pads, so out of the dressing room comes Doug Atkins dressed in a t-shirt with shorts and a helmet. So we're all saying to each other, what's wrong with Doug? He runs down to the other end of the field and then back into the dressing room and disappeared. After practice, we all rushed in and said, Doug, Doug, are you hurt or something? He said, no, I was just breaking in a new helmet. And that was the excuse he used not to practice. The big bad character known as Doug Atkins was born on May 8, 1930 in Humboldt, Tennessee. Basketball was his first love, and after his high school won the Tennessee State Championship, Atkins moved on to play hoops at the University of Tennessee. However, he was quickly spotted by football coach Bob Neeland and helped Tennessee grab the 1951 National Championship. By 1952, he was named an All-American defensive tackle, but he also established quite the reputation on the Tennessee track team when he cleared six foot six in the high jump, good for second place in the SEC conference meet. What an enormous combination on the football field if you think about it. A giant of a man at six foot eight, who was not only the strongest player in the field, but also one who could leap over opponents as needed. The wonderful natural talents of Doug Atkins allowed him to be drafted in the first round of the 1953 draft by the Cleveland Browns before moving on to the Bears from 1955 through 1966 and finally to the New Orleans Saints to conclude his career from 1967 to 1969. 
He was named to eight Pro Bowls, won two NFL titles, and was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1982. But in between those years, there were stories, many stories, and we're happy to share them with you on this episode of When Football Was Football. Atkins, it seems, was very quotable, and so were his teammates. It seemed like everyone had a favorite Doug Atkins story, whether it be from players, coaches, or friends. Atkins recalled that when he signed with the Cleveland Browns for, he quoted, two cheeseburgers and eight beers, while adding, we had to have fun because we didn't make any money. In reality, Atkins earned just $6,800 during that rookie year with the Browns, then found himself being traded to the Bears prior to the 1955 season in what Bears owner coach George Hallis called one of the finest trades I ever made. It was said that Atkins irritated Cleveland coach Paul Brown by constantly burping loudly during one of Brown's team meetings. And so, he was sent to the Bears. Some of our favorite stories from that time focused on the ongoing, shall we say, differences between Atkins and Hallis while the big end was with the Bears. Although Hallis has admitted that there was never a better defensive end in history than Atkins, there apparently was a great deal of friction between the old school coach and his most valuable defender. Former Bears lineman Stan Jones once remarked, there was a time when there was a question as to who was running the Bears, Doug Atkins or George Hallis. Atkins loved to wet his whistle after a tough practice or during training camp and Hallis shared a story in his autobiography about that relationship. Hallis said, one night a fan phoned that Doug was drunk at a bar. I drove over. Doug saw me enter the place and shuddered a tumultuous river of profanities. I walked right up to him and countered with a barrage that for volume and variety made his assault a peaceful brook compared to my Niagara Falls. Doug put down his glass and came to camp. At 10 minutes before nine the next morning, he was out there on the field with no trace of foggy-headedness or wobbly limbs. Doug became a powerful bear, and we became good friends. Other tales tell us about the type of appetite a professional Atkins size displayed. An article in the Los Angeles Times once reported that Atkins enjoyed a dinner consisting of 45 pieces of fried chicken chased down by two pitchers of martinis. Of course, the latter item was somewhat new to Atkins after he gave up beer because he found it was fattening. Then there was a story that Atkins encountered an Eagles player in a bar after one game. It was a tough game, apparently, because some type of dispute followed and Atkins, while still holding his beer, hoisted the other player and pressed him against the ceiling using just one hand. So what would make Atkins mad during a game? Apparently, if an opponent used an illegal block or spoke in a disrespectful language towards him, it would surely earn Atkins' attention. Green Bay monster Ray Nitschke remembered Atkins well, saying, The strongest player I saw in the NFL was Doug Atkins. None of the Green Bay Packers liked to mess with him. If we talked to him during a game, it was always about something pleasant like warm weather and a clear sky, because nobody wanted to get him pumped up. A Minnesota Vikings rookie once found out how not to address the on-field presence of Big Doug Atkins, as told by former Tennessee coach Philip Fulmer, who said, I remember one story when he was playing in a preseason game against Minnesota. A rookie back tried to cut block him. He grabbed the rookie through his shoulder pads and carried him back to the huddle. Fran Tarkington was the quarterback of the Vikings, and Atkins told Tarkington, if this kid tries to cut me again, I'm going to kill you. Tarkington then looked at the rookie and said, you're not going to cut him anymore. So those were just some of the stories surrounding the legend of Doug Atkins. Or as teammate Ronnie Bull once stated, there are a thousand stories about Doug, but 989 of them can't be told in a mixed group. Another player once remarked, Doug taught me a lot of lessons. For example, he taught me to count how many martinis one could drink before a ball game. And how was it to share some space as a roommate with Doug Atkins? Linebacker Larry Morris of the Bears was the MVP in the 1963 championship game win over the Giants. 
Perhaps his most difficult task during his time with the team was serving as the roommate of Doug Atkins. Morris recalled, I was Doug's roommate eight years and it seemed like 15. My wife said once to Doug, hey, I, I see you've stopped drinking. Is it the Lord? And Doug said, nope, it's my liver. Atkins was traded to New Orleans in 1967 and continued to antagonize quarterbacks even after 10 knee surgeries by that time. As columnist Rick Cleveland once noted, even at the end of his career, Atkins could still terrorize then brutalize a quarterback. Atkins didn't just avoid blockers, he would grab them, lift them, and cast them aside like puppets. So during his lengthy career, Atkins made those eight Pro Bowls, was named to the 1960s All-Decade team, as well as the NFL's 100th anniversary All-Time team. As mentioned, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1982 and the College Football Hall of Fame in 1985, and after being with the Saints for just three seasons at the end of his career. The number 81 of Doug Atkins was retired by the team. Upon the passing of Atkins in 2015, Chicago Bears chairman George McCaskey said, Doug Atkins is an all-time great who will be remembered as one of the pillars of the 1963 championship Bears. He had a freakish combination of size and athletic ability and was as tough as anyone who ever stepped on a football field. His former teammate, Mike Ditka, said, Atkins was just a vicious pass rusher. He'd take the tackle all the way back to the quarterback and knock them both down. He had a great wingspan. He just played the game hard. He played the game the way you were supposed to play it. Well, it was all worth it to Doug Atkins, who during his induction speech at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1982, simply stated, football has been good to me. It has been my life. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Doug Atkins, a 280-pound sweetheart off the field, but a combination of Godzilla and Superman on it. Thank you for listening to this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. Thanks again. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.